You're listening to Elevating Early Childhood. I'm Vanessa Levin, your host, and I help teachers of preschool and pre-K teach better, save time, and live more. Today's guest has been an enthusiastic bilingual pre-K teacher for 15 years. She's served as a program coordinator for her district's kinder readiness program, as well as a bilingual facilitator. She loves creating songs and playful, language-rich environments for her students. It's none other than Maria Mercedes Champion. So Maria Mercedes, I am so excited that you're here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm more excited, I think. (laughs) Well, it's always a pleasure talking to you because you are super passionate about early childhood education and in particular, um, the role we as teachers play in the lives of children who speak a second language or maybe they're learning English for the first time, dual language learners, bilingual learners, many different names. We'll get into all that in a minute, but um, I don't know about you, but I get all these questions all the time from people. And I know you probably get them in your DMs on Instagram because that's where you're known most there. Um, You find her. Don't forget, you can find her there. Um, But I get this question. I don't speak Spanish. Do I have to learn Spanish to teach this student? So usually these are teachers who may be experiencing for the first time a student in their classroom who doesn't speak English. What I know what I would say, and I will get there later, but what do you say to people like that when they hit your DMs? Well, um, and my DMs are all in Spanish because I teach, (laughs) I have the fortune to teach Spanish to my Spanish speaking students. So what we're doing there or what I'm doing is setting a foundation for future learning of any other languages. So not only English, but I hope they get to learn three, four, five languages later on. Um, So of course I teach in Spanish, but we need to understand that many classrooms are ESL students. So, you know, if I have a student that comes from Korea or from India that I did before, I am teaching English as a second language. But something that is very important is like, yeah, I don't speak the language, So I won't be able to communicate with the student in their language. So I need to start getting like the tools that I can bring into how can I help my student learn a second language? Because there's so little, and we're talking preschoolers. This is their first educational experience. So we need to be careful into bringing the student and making the student feel welcome. And the best way to do that is not to try to learn a few words in their language because that's not going to be enough. Never, you you know, maybe if you learn how to say hello, but that's not going to be enough. So a good way to do that is through the family. So embrace that family's home language, that student's home language and the culture. So I think we do that with each one of our students, no matter where they, if they speak English or not, So we need to really bring that into the class. And that has to be worked before the kids come to the classroom and while they're in the classroom. So we we need to find out, first of all, where are they from? Because if they speak Spanish, it doesn't mean that everybody is from Mexico. Mm -hmm. So we have Colombia, all South American countries, but Brazil, we all speak Spanish, Spain. So we want to make sure, okay, where are you from? Because sometimes as uh, Spanish speaking people, we are nothing wrong with that. You know, Mexico is beautiful, but we're not all from Mexico. And we want to have that too. Different words, different uh, ways with different foods. So we want to find out where are the families from? If we can bring a little bit of their culture, you know, I always ask my families to bring a family picture. So that family picture is going to be, we all have families, no matter if you speak English or no. Is the same. So we need to find the things that are the same to make the kids feel welcome. So yes, no, you don't need to learn anything about the language, but you do need to learn about the culture. So it will be too quick for you to learn, you know, a few words. That's beautiful. The other part is like in a bilingual, in a dual classroom, you want to make sure that the languages are very are separated. 
Right. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know if you and I talked about this before, Maria Mercedes, but um, I used to live and teach in Seoul, South Korea. But when I went to live there and work there and teach there, teach young children, I didn't speak a lick of Korean. <laughs> and this was before the internet existed. And guess what? When I left after a year, I was there on a year contract. I left. I spoke a little bit of Korean. I wasn't fluent. But it was just the the words I picked up that were survival skills, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I could ask where the bathroom was and I could order something at a restaurant. And, you know, I, I could read the, the stop signs and the bus signs and the subway signs and all of that type of thing. But um, thinking to my students, you know, I didn't speak any any Korean when I started there. And when I had my first preschool class um, there, I remember they gave me a translator who was supposed to be there to help out. And my kids did not um, did not talk to me. They only talked to her, right? They were relying on the translator. And so I, I quickly realized if I gave the translator some errands to do, <laughs> that it was easier when she was out of the room to get the children to attend to what I was saying and what I was doing. And um, they really learned quickly. I mean, there, there was no need for me to learn the language prior to teaching them because I was just teaching them English. I mean, I wasn't teaching them science and math okay. and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, um, you know, it worked much better for me that way. And I'm not telling everyone out there to send your assistant out of the room if you have one, but, <laughs> but there's no need to know every single word. And I really quickly, just from that experience, like the first, by the end of the first week, I knew basic words that I needed for preschool, like bathroom. And there's a couple of different words that you can use for, you know, there's not always just one word for each thing. There's a couple of different words you need to know. Um, you know, mommy and daddy, like if they were crying for mommy and daddy, um, when they wanted to go home, um, if they needed like the word that they called me, I needed to learn that. Um, so I learned that because I was immersed in their culture, in their language, but, um, that doesn't mean that if you're in the United States, where we are right now, um, that that's the situation that you might be in. There's no need to learn the entire language, right? There's no need to translate everything that you say for your students because and it's a it's immersion. Translating what you're saying, what happened to your translator there, you realize soon that, you know what, they're not paying attention to me. They're waiting. And then they will may look at you and wait, like, okay, when do I get the translation? So that's not going to really help for the learning process. Mm -hmm. The other part that we need to consider is like in pre-K, what we're really teaching are those social emotional skills and language and communication. Right. Yes, I know we have a curriculum and it's really <laughs> heavy and now they're putting more stuff in there. But if we don't start from language and communication, social emotional, we're not going anywhere. Right. So what do we do? We sing a lot. We have a lot of posters. And if we do the color red, we have something red. So mm -hmm. that's how everybody's learning. And that's how your students are going to get it. I, I My Korean student, I, I had a program called The Letter Leader uh, at a time where, you know, you're like February and you're realizing that your kids, they're still going like, uh, what letter is this? That's the letter of. Uh, my mommy's name and you're like yeah but the name so I started getting a little worried so I created this program called the letter leaders where I told the kids that they were going to be letter leaders so if they knew at that time the standards were lower I think it was 10 letters names 10 letter sounds they will be a letter leader but the important part was you're a leader because you're helping your friends and they're like why so I made buttons and they became letter leaders so my student from Korea that we need to remember that when you learn a second language, it takes at least five to seven years for the child to start speaking it. They may be able to understand it. They may be able to uh, say a few words, but the, the talking takes a longer time. So we're, if we're expecting our kids to talk, that's not going to happen if we work with preschoolers or kindergartners. There, it's going to take longer. But this little kid, and he was so precious, 
he, I'm doing the assessment because the whole idea was the kid will ask me to do the assessment. So he's standing there and he's going like this. He will move like this. So cute. So I'm looking at him moving like this. And I'm like, um, are you ready to be a letter leader? And he's like, <laughs> so I did the assessment. And at that time, now I lose, I use sign language. But at that time, so I will say Apple, Apple, it, it, it will be like uh, Apple, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, a baby, but, but I had a movement with the sound. So this kid, he was a letter leader. And I remember the father telling me, he didn't know any letters a week ago. I'm like, he did. It, we have been practicing the whole year. But this, this thing, he was just communicating like, I can do this. He was smiling. And he was a letter leader because we had a lot of movement, because we have a lot of repetition. So it wasn't memorizing just like that. It was like working for a long time doing something. So they are capable of learning. And we need to understand that because the research is out there, we need to go and look into, okay, do they supposed to talk? and say, hello, how are you? No, they're not going to do that. But there's other ways that we can do it. And like in my class, I like to do a lot of movement. So when we say, hello, how are you? And then they respond, good. I'm like, no, nah, let's do incredible. So mm -hmm. the kid that may not be able to say that word, they're making a connection with, oh, incredible. Okay, I can do that. How are you doing? So we're making connections. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do in pre-K. So I think everybody is doing a great job. It's just we need to understand that there's research, there's, uh, there's best practices, and go back and look and don't worry if the child is not talking as much as the other kids because that's absolutely normal. Right. Don't worry if the child sometimes is looking a little bit like, okay, what's happening here? They may not be understanding what's happening. So we need to bring more tools mm -hmm. and we need to, but we do it with preschoolers. We do it all the time. So just give an extra. If you're talking about a bear, you bring the picture of it. If you're talking right. about, you know, rhyming, let's, let's, of course, we, we, we talk phonological awareness and that everybody is doing the same. So they will be able to get, get all that information with you using the tools that you have as a preschool teacher to uh, give them what they need. Yeah, and I think the cool thing about working with children who are speaking, you know, primarily another language at home is that, um, you know, preschool is is geared specifically for them because so much of what we do is hands-on. So much of what we do in preschool is visual. So if you're learning a second language for the first time, if you're learning English, if you're a child learning English, preschool I think is the best place to do it because our whole day is filled with visuals and movements. I think sometimes it's just a little tweak to be more intentional about how we do things um, that are really gonna set those children up for success. And um, another question I get a lot that teachers who are in this situation for the very first time usually have is maybe they have more than one student in their class who speaks that particular language. Let's say it's Spanish. Maybe they have three or four and they want to know, should I prohibit them from speaking their native language in the classroom so that they'll learn English more quickly because they would tend maybe to talk to each other. Um, I know what my answer is, but I want to hear it from a professional over here, <laughs> Maria Mercedes. Would you, what would you say to a teacher who was wondering if they should make sure the children aren't speaking their native language in the classroom? Well, you know what? The best way to learn a second language is to have a strong foundation in your home language. Yes. So the first thing I say is like they need to speak to other friends because that's setting that foundation. You need to not only allow that, but you need to tell the family how important it is for the families to continue speaking in Spanish. And I'm sure a lot of you may be going through this because I am, every year I see it more. And I don't see it with other languages. When I had my Korean students, my, my students from India, they will speak their language like at home, no problem. It wasn't like, do I supposed to? 
our Spanish speaking families, and we know why, because culturally they have been put down uh, before, you know, you have, you know, my grandma, my grandpa, they spoke Spanish, but they couldn't speak it at school. It was not allowed. So we have a lot of families that they, you know, friends that they tell me, I don't know Spanish because my grandma couldn't speak it at, at school. So they say, no, you don't do it. We don't speak that. Uh, things have changed. And now, maybe 15 years, 20 years, you know, uh, it's more fashionable. We have more artists that speak the language. So it's people want to learn how to speak it. So now, unfortunately, we still have that stigma. And every year, I have to have that conversation with my families because the parents want the kids to learn the language, but they're not teaching it to them. So I asked families, last year I had a family, two years ago, they came from up north and the child couldn't speak Spanish very much. And I'm like, okay, do you speak Spanish to him? And they're looking at me like, mm, yes, we do. And I'm like, okay, so when you go to a restaurant, what do you speak when you're having a, a meal? English. And I say, why? So it's always that question of, are you proud of the language? Or do you still feel a little bit like if I speak Spanish or any other language in public, now that things are getting a little bit crazy, is that going to be seen like less? Mm -hmm. And that's something that as educators, because we need to remember that we are not only pre-K teachers, pre-K facilitators, we educate the families too. We, uh, when they tell me, okay, why don't you say homework? Because I had homework. Well, I tell them that doesn't work. <laughs> Do you like doing the homework? Did you? No, you know what? I didn't. Okay. So sometimes we need to say no or uh, tracing the name with uh, uh, just tracing it all the time that because they do it. No, that doesn't work. You're not making a connection. So sometimes as educators, we cannot be afraid of, oh, the parents want this. No, mm -hmm. you need to know what program do you mm -hmm. have? What is your philosophy? Because the parents can tell me a lot of stuff, but I'm the one that went to school, have been educating myself for this. So, okay, uh, do three-year-olds do puzzles? Yes, they do. Two-year-olds too, yeah. Do they do the, the wood ones? No, they do the hard ones so they don't put it in their mouths, but can we work with it? Yeah. So there's ways to do things. And one that to me is very important is to help the families understand of the importance of speaking the home language at home, right. reading in their home language continue yeah. when they see the kid it's like hello how are you in their language because mm -hmm. i have a lot of students that their families speak the language they speak spanish but then it gets to a point and that breaks my heart where the child is a teenager and they're not going to come and talk to mom and daddy or the family about their problems because mom and mom doesn't speak english what no you should have been talking to your child in Spanish, in mm -hmm. whatever language, to set that culture, because we're losing our roots mm -hmm. that are our languages. Yeah, I, I really like that because I've had so many families over the years, because I worked exclusively with children who were learning English, and so many of the families that I worked with over the years wanted to speak only English at home to help their child. And of course, this is all done out of love. Every parent yeah. wants the very best yeah. for their child. And they think that's what is best because that makes sense to our adult brains. This is how we learn. We're going to immerse our child in English. And in fact, you know, quite the opposite is true. There's so much research out there these days about how the human brain acquires a second language. And all of that research points to retaining the native language because you need that as the foundation upon which to learn the new one. Um, so I think that's so important. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. Um, but you know, another question I get a lot from my listeners, viewers is, how do I communicate with the parents of my students if they don't speak English? And that is a really big problem a lot of teachers have because sometimes they are maybe they are sending home information, whether that's electronically or in a paper format, like about a field trip 
right? And they need to have permission slips signed and there's important information the parents need to know, um, you know, all kinds of things, you know, throughout the year, all this information yeah. goes home. And how can they best communicate with their families and maybe even about their child's progress or anything like that? And, and there's a whole bunch of different thoughts about how to do it best. Can you kind of lay that out for us and let us know what you think? Well, now technology is fantastic. So everything that we do in, in, in any language can be translated. Of course, I'm always very careful with that mm -hmm. because we need to have respect for the language. So sometimes we see some, some <laughs> things that in Spanish are like, oh my God, I don't even understand what you're trying to say. <laughs> so there's always a good idea to find that person that can help you a little bit with that. But we have fantastic uh, uh, applications. CISO is a very good application okay. where the parents can translate whatever you're sending they can translate and their translation is pretty good because they not only have it like, they do their like a Spanish LA, Spanish Spain. So they really did the work to make sure that you get good translation. Uh, ESGI, like with assessments, they have, you can translate everything there. And that is very easy for the family to do it. Uh, but at the time when you have like parent-teacher conferences, something very important, I think it's always important to have a translator. And mm -hmm. it's important to have not somebody that will translate a translator. So it's a there's a difference there. So some in all the districts, and even um, if you're at a daycare center, you start looking for that person that is you know, bilingual, but not only bilingual, because there's a difference between being bilingual and having the biliteracy. So you want that person that can speak, can read, can write in both languages. How can you find that person? Usually, like when I had um, a family that it was from Korea, I had one that it was from an area that the language was very different. So usually there's a community and you can mm -hmm. ask, the families because they are coming here with nothing, no, they don't have the language. So there's always a community where they have that person that represents them at school. So I found that out and I was like, this is the best. So I had the number of this person and I'm like, did they get the information? Because at the end, it's important to have that one on one. It's important mm -hmm. to see the family. I could, I had my family that I will always talk to at the end of the day and by you know like an hour later the daddy was calling because the mom is like she tried to tell me something I look like I don't know what I was happening but she was communicating to her husband that spoke a little more and he was always clarified so I knew it was like okay we're trying here we're trying here but that respect for Sometimes we make a mistake and it's just getting whoever. First of all, don't ever, ever, ever have the child translating for right. the parent. That is disrespectful. You're putting the mm -hmm. child in a situation that the child doesn't need to be there. You're giving the child too much power. Uh, and the family, imagine how a parent feels like my child is translating. Don't ever do that. That's not okay. Uh, not even at the end of the day when you're giving a little information because that is not letting that parent feel empowered. Remember, you come here for whatever reason and not being able to speak the language is pretty difficult. So when your child is the one translating, mm, that doesn't work. So always try to look for a translator. I will volunteer myself. If you need me, call me. I will be happy to do it because now... We have this telephone that is so easy. You can do the Zoom meeting. You can do a meet. You can even uh, do it on FaceTime. So you always have somebody that, you know, has that authority and the parent will feel like, okay, this is a translator, not just mm -hmm. anybody. And yeah. especially not the kids. Not even if the kids are teenagers. Right. And you think that because that's not okay for the family. It doesn't make you feel... Like you are in charge. 
Right. I think that's such an important point about not having a child in the family translate, whether it's the child in your class, which I wouldn't trust a four-year-old to translate anything. <laughs> they, don't, they don't have enough skills yet. But, um, you know, a lot of times parents would bring their older children or their teenage children. And um, I think the best way for us to wrap our brains around what that is like, if we ourselves don't speak a second language, is, I don't know if you've seen this, Maria Mercedes, but it's the, the movie Coda on Apple Plus. There is a fantastic scene in that movie. It's, it's, it's a phenomenal movie, if you haven't seen it, um, where the teenage daughter is translating for her deaf parents at, at a doctor's office. And that scene is so powerful. And I think it really drives home the point that it's not fair to have the children translating for their families. It's better to have a translator. And, you know, just because somebody speaks the language does not mean they're a great translator. I've had many, many over the years who, you know, they weren't translating what I said. Um, and we all knew in my district where I work, because we had translators on staff, we all knew who would actually translate and who would interpret and say their own thing. <laughs> because I speak enough Spanish to know. And I'm like, that's not exactly what I said. So, you know, it's a skill. And I think that putting that burden on, on children is, is unfair to the child and can create lots of problems later in life for that child. So I always felt like having phone conversations in English wasn't fair to my families because they couldn't rely on any of the visual cues. They couldn't see my expressions. They couldn't see my body language. Um, all they had to go on was the words. And if they were already on shaky ground with English, um, then it really was ineffective. And one of the examples I used was one time, um, one of my colleagues, my very first year in public school, she didn't speak Spanish, but she was trying to explain to a family um, that the bus that their child rode was going to be late. There had been some kind of a problem with the bus. And so she wanted to call all the families in her class of students who were on that bus to let them know. And when she did that, she was speaking in English and it caused a big problem for one of her families because they didn't understand the, the difference between the word. I don't know what word she used, but they thought she had said the bus had been in an accident. Oh, Lord. Yes. Wow. And they, they rushed to the school. They were hysterical. It was so sad. It brings tears to my eyes just thinking about it. They thought their child might be dead. And I was like, this is a good example of why we don't rely on that because you could be calling to say so-and-so had a good day, <laughs> but if they don't speak enough English, that could keep them up at night. What did she really say? What was, you know, uh, you know, it, it's just, I really prefer that face-to-face -face if possible. Culturally, remember that in other countries, your teacher is not calling you yes. to just say things because that's not very, that's not normal. I mean, I don't right. remember when I went to school, the teacher calling, that was just kind of like, what? So <laughs> it could be like, why mm -hmm. are they calling me? So right. here we're used to that, but for other cultures, mm -hmm. it could be like a huge surprise. And that's when I say, you know, embracing that family's culture is like, how do you want me to communicate something? Yeah, it, for You know, sure. sometimes I make phone calls, but it's not any bad news. So, you know, because, yeah, the first thing they answer when you call during the day is like, everything okay, Mrs. Champion? Oh, no, no, I just wanted to tell you right. that. Because it's kind of scary. You're like, why are you right. calling me? It's 10. Right. What happened? <laughs> so imagine with the second language. Even yeah. when you speak over the telephone, like something that I never do, like they send me a text that is something important or something that something happened, my child, I will never answer it with a text. I will call. Why? Because at least when we talk, it's better. But if it's something that, can wait so we can do it in person. Well, let's do it in person because mm -hmm. that language and that communication that is the nonverbal is very important. Yeah, so for sure. To, and especially with languages, because when you learn a second language, and this is something that, you know, families, I tell them, you know, your brain is more powerful. 
you have the capacity to switch tasks easier because when you learn that second language, you have to kind of like rely on that nonverbal communication because you didn't understand half the things. So you're looking at the person, is he mad? Is he what's happening? So you have that capacity and your brain actually later on, and this is research, that it was done not exactly for um, bilingualism or by literacy, but it was uh, it was for uh, medical. It was a, a doctor from Canada that realized that when you have a uh, second language, your brain then later on uh, doesn't deteriorate as much with mm -hmm. illnesses like Alzheimer's and uh, right. dementia. So it yeah. helps a lot for a lot of different things. So learning a second language and embracing the culture and um, empowering the families for that is always going to be a win-win. It's just how we yeah. do it and how we make it more the norm instead right. of like, why is this so difficult? Absolutely. So, so far we've talked about, do you need to speak Spanish in order to teach your students who speak Spanish? And the short answer was no. Uh, and we talked about communicating with parents of students who don't speak English. You gave us some great tips for that. Um, next up, before we go, I'd like to talk briefly about um, how can we help our students, our Spanish speaking students or students who just speak a different language than we do, how can we help them feel more included in the classroom? And I know you have lots of great ideas and some mindset shifts that we can make around this question. What do you think? So first of all, you know, we want to include the whole family. Uh, always make sure that you get their picture and everybody has their family picture. Something that I did when I had, now I only do uh, Spanish in my class, but uh, when I had like three different languages, something that I did was I put the name of the learning centers in a little paper, I typed them, and uh, I asked one of the parents, could you translate this to your language? And you have to see the face of that mom. She was so proud. She's like, yeah. So I thought she was just going to write it down. Oh, no, no. She typed everything. Thank God, because it was, uh, I think it was Korean or Chinese or Mandarin. So it was hard to. So we, I put the names of the centers in every language of the kids that I had in my classroom. Do they know how to read? No, but they see it. And that's something that they see at home. So that made them feel really good. Another one is to invite those families. And now with this whole COVID and all that, we can do it you know, through Zoom or FaceTime to talk a little bit about their culture mm -hmm. and what do they do. But at the end, I think it's more about making the child feel welcome in general through the environment, through what you put in your classroom having an, a well-organized classroom that is labeled. So the kid may not understand, but if they see a picture of something, they can put it back there. That's making you feel good because you are like everybody else and everybody else is lost too. Preschoolers is their first time. So it's going to make them feel good to know where things go, to have a classroom that is inviting, to have a place where they know, okay, the restroom is over here. And I teach my kids this for restroom, even mm -hmm. though this is English. But, you know, for my students, I'm like, yeah. So if you need to go to the restroom, you do this and then you go. So one thing I've noticed, Maria Mercedes, is that quite often teachers, I believe teachers always have the best intentions at heart. I really do. Um, and sometimes our best intentions can go awry. So, for example, right now, when we're recording this, um, a lot of folks are focusing on Hispanic Heritage Month. And so maybe they're told or maybe they want to be inclusive of the students in their classroom. So they're doing things like maybe making sombreros or eating tacos or things like that. Now, what are your thoughts on those types of activities or that type of interpretation of celebrating a culture? Well, I love what you're saying about that we're always doing things with the best intentions, but intentions, good intentions are not enough. We have to really investigate and 
find out what that means. And we don't celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month in Colombia because we don't need to, because we always celebrate being Colombians, the same with Mexicans or anybody in other places. So we want to be careful not to stereotype something, something. I had a book that I love the book because it has a lot of repetition and it's about Los Mariachis. You know, everybody knows what a mariachi mm -hmm. is. So the kids right. love it. I love the book because it has rhyming, repetition. So I read the book and I have a mariachi hat, but it's because I'm reading that about mariachis. So yes, you can, you know, bring the hat, but you need to know when and why, because otherwise, and I told people, I tell people, you know what, if anybody wears, uh, because there's a huge controversy about the culture and are you taking the culture? Being from Colombia, if anybody, if I see you wearing a Colombian hat and a Colombian dress, I will be like, girl, you look fantastic. I <laughs> love it. We are not going to be offended by that because you're wearing it because you want to show people, hey, this is the outfit from Colombia. But we live in the United States, and here we need to be a little bit more careful with that. So before you do anything, ask, why am I doing this? So always ask somebody else, but no, don't make an assumption that that's what we need. What we're doing in my school that is really uh, interesting, we have done it for two years, is like anybody that has that background, um, they're coming to an announcements and they're talking about their culture. So, hey, I grew up here, but we made tamales with the family and that, you know, mm -hmm. put that in the culture. You know what? I grew up here and somebody made cookies. Uh, of course, I talk about Colombia and I say, well, show your teachers where, uh, ask your teachers where Colombia is in the map. We're in South America. And so, yeah, get the expert in, in the sense that do they live there? Do they come from there? Because we can all have a different experience with the culture and that's valid. That's still okay. Mm -hmm. So if somebody says yeah. tacos is my thing, well, that's fine. But we just want to make sure that we research and find out what is okay before we present it. Don't get so excited about the sombrero or the flower and be like, Woo! or, oh, let's make it <laughs> well, Wait, but it, how are we relating that to is that really what represents? Yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, one thing my school did that I think worked really well was they would focus on the food because we all eat, right? We all eat. Everyone eats. And um, we would do like a family night and everyone, because we had children from all different Spanish speaking countries, right? And so they would have a family night where they would cook a dish from their country that was a favorite in their house. And so that's when I started learning that, A, I loved pupusas. And second of all, <laughs> what country that they are made in, you know, not everyone has tacos or tamales, like you were saying. Um, I learned about all different kinds of wonderful food that I loved, which was you know, could be good or bad for me <laughs> personally. Um, you know, so I think that it's really important to take all of that into consideration because we want to be, because we come from a good place, we want to be inclusive, but sometimes the way we go about it um, can be a stumbling block and can actually alienate some families. So if I did a whole lesson on tacos and I had part of my class, like you said, that was from Spain, they would be wondering what is going on and you're not really celebrating me. So I think that's really important to think of uh, or think about. Um, Maria Mercedes, I want to thank you so much for joining us here at Elevating Early Childhood. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and gain from your perspectives. Thanks a lot. Thank you so, so much for inviting me. And if we just kind of like put everything in just a few words. It's like, we want to make sure that our students don't lose their language because they're trying to learn English. Or sometimes they lose their whole language and then they don't speak the language anymore or they just have a few words here and there. So yes, we want to embrace English but let's make sure that we don't forget that they come from other places. And language is what really 
gets that culture and that root of who you are. So we don't want students to learn English and forget the other language. We want them to learn English and learn every other one they can learn and have their home language always as part of who they are. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much. And Thank until next time, yeah. I'm so happy to see you again. Yes, same here. And until next time, I'm Vanessa Levin, and this is Maria Mercedes Champion. Onward and upward. If you think these videos are valuable, you have got to come check out the Teaching Trailblazers program. Teaching Trailblazers is the place for teachers like you to get the professional development resources and support you need to thrive. It's where you can learn relevant, life-changing best practices with professional development created specifically around the challenges early childhood teachers face. It's where you can get access to a complete research-based pre-K curriculum that you can use either to supplement your existing curriculum or use on its own to get 100% of your students kindergarten ready by the end of the year. And it's where you can hang out and connect over all things early childhood with other teachers just like you and me. It's my favorite place on earth and it will change your teacher life, I guarantee it. Come join us at teachingtrailblazers.com to get more information and apply today. That's teachingtrailblazers.com. I can't wait to see you there.